Alright, so are you going to do the introduction I, or am I? You go ahead. I don't... What do I say? I don't remember what we said last <laughs> say time. say hello and welcome to Lost in Criteria. I'm Adam Glass. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. Hello and welcome to Lost in Criterion. I'm Adam Glass. And I'm Pat Dorgan. <laughs> wait, Pat, we messed that one up. Or, wait, okay, we need to no, I, it again. I, 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 I'm telling you, I'm leaving all of this in. This is our second episode, and we are covering the the classic film. Uh, what was it called? Oh yeah, Seven Samurai. Um, yeah, that's all. Ah, I got. Pat, fine. You directed in nineteen fifty four by Akira Kurosawa. Uh, I mentioned. So you researched this stuff. I didn't. I didn't. It's the date. It's in parentheses after the title, no matter where you see the movie. Mm. <laughs> anyway, you mean the internet, YouTube, or I, not YouTube? Even if uh, YouTube. <laughs> I'm sure it's yeah. on YouTube too, um, somewhere. Probably. Anyway, Akira Kurosawa. I mentioned I mentioned last week that uh, I've never seen an Akira Kurosawa old movie, and I felt great shame. Um, I brought my family great shame, and I think I really need to stop with the whole uh, seppuku motif before I before I offend someone. Yeah, before you actually do something, yeah. something you're going to regret. Well, something your family will yes. regret. You won't. Because, well, I'll be. Eh, I'll be. I'll be dead. dead with my guts pouring out of my body. Is that yep. too graphic? I mean, it's early here, but... Yeah, that was way too graphic. It's, it's late there, so... Um, I yes. I'm going to have nightmares. Don't have nightmares. I have nightmares. I have nightmares. Anyway. As we mentioned before, Pat and I are old friends. He lives in Japan now, and we're talking about movies. So, uh, working yes. our way through the... And today we're talking about a Japanese movie. And I just talked over Pat, but... Yeah, well, I was just saying, today we're going to actually talk about a Japanese Yes, yeah, so you've, so you've got the cultural impact of this, I suppose. Uh, not really. <laughs> I've got nothing well, on that's, that. Well, that's certainly interesting, because um, obviously Akira Kurosawa is one of, regarded as one of the greatest directors to come out of Japan. Uh, one, one of the greatest directors of all greatest time Greatest directors of all time, in general, obviously. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, I'm, I've read in background material studying for this um, that uh, study you mean Wikipedia? Study, not studying by any means but um, that he's very controversial within Japan and with uh, critics who who approach things from a sort of a east versus west mentality uh, is that he's he's a very western director in the way he does things um, and therefore not and not exactly a shining example of Japanese cinema as Japanese cinema insularly uh, defines itself because he's very he's very mm. western in the way he does things yeah and I, I don't want to get too heavy into western versus eastern cinema just because my views on the Japanese cinema I've seen <laughs> outside of this has not been <laughs> entirely positive Well, we're I've not had a lot of good experiences with watching uh, Japanese uh Media well, in general, as, so. as Westerners, I, uh, I suppose we have. A, yeah, it's who knows. Maybe it's just we're broken. We're broken. <laughs> we can't do it. Yeah. Nonetheless, uh, this movie is, uh, it, for all its Westernness, it's it's sort of action adventure, epicness, and it's very epic. Three and a half hours long. Um, though, though I, uh, I I didn't really feel it at three and a half hours. I guess um, we got to the intermission at an hour and forty five minutes, about, and it popped up, and I thought wow, how long I've been watching this, because it really didn't feel to me like I've been sitting there for nearly two hours already. You know, and what I'm going to say on that topic is I'm, I'm a little bit skewed, because I've watched this movie many, many times. I used to own it. And, um, you know, honestly, it's hard to tell if it's just uncomfortable seating that is causing <laughs> me to feel the time, or if it's... Because well, I, I had to watch this on my computer, yeah. and so no, I'm, I'm sitting in, like, I'm sitting in, like, a folding chair. I see. Watching this is not not a good plan. And it's a Japanese folding chair, so I assume that it folds up yeah. like a swan. Exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. It's made entirely of paper. 
Um, <laughs> well, no, like, but you know, I was thinking this when I was watching it. I was like, man, if you paid to watch this in theaters, though, you got the best deal ever. <laughs> because you got three and a half hours worth of film for your it was money. A great film. Did you? Yeah. Right. Well, exactly. And so, like, if you were sitting in a theater, I would be like, oh man. I hit the jackpot this time. But indeed, mm, indeed. When you're sitting on a folding chair in your yeah, apartment, not, no, not, not working out. Um, uh, I, I suppose I, I said to Kira Kurosawa, well, certainly one of the best directors, one of the most influential directors, and uh, there's a lot of there's a little bit Shakespearean to him because a lot of uh, even in this movie alone, a lot of what happens we might consider cliched in the action film genre today. But he's really he's what he's not defining in the movie. He's codifying at least. He's uh, he's yeah. uh, presenting it in the way that it will be presented in the future, but not in a way that anyone really presented it before. Um, yeah, which I mean, do you want to just kind of go through, make a real quick list of the things that Wikipedia <laughs> says that he did for the first time? Well, uh, if you if you've got that there. I've got some of them written down. Let's see here. He was among the first to use the sort of heroes being gathered motif uh, there's, uh, uh, in an action going film. Around like, and finding sort everybody. Of, yeah, yeah. That you see a lot, especially in like not superhero but superhero esque even uh, just action kind of movies. Thrill it, like uh, yeah. Like, what's it with the George Clooney and the. Right, your Ocean's, Ocean's Eleven, Eleven and things like that, sort of where you're where you're gathering the tea yeah. that will help you overcome the crisis. Yeah. Um, then you've also got one. Um, the other one that they made a big deal about is uh, this was Roger Ebert talking says that um, the scene at the beginning where the main character, uh, the main samurai character, uh, goes to save the child from the thief. And you see that whole him shaving his top knot and all that stuff at the beginning. That sort of ancillary action at the beginning of the yeah. film to Intr- establish the character without establishing the plot. Introducing our hero in um, a completely unrelated task, yeah. Activity, yeah, is he may have been the first to ever use that, is what Ebert says. And, you know, I guess he's a pretty reliable source of that. So. He's probably seen more movies than we have. Probably, by the time we're done with this podcast, maybe <laughs> we'll, not. We'll have seen a lot. We'll have seen a lot. Yeah, we'll... Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so, I mean, those are the two that they had mainly on on Wikipedia. And as far as I can tell, those are the main ones that people focus yeah. on. Seems like... Um, <laughs> I think someone something else he did that I've not seen in other movies of the era I've watched, but certainly happens. So I've, a fairly minor one, I think, but... Uh, but um, near the end, I, I I I don't speak Japanese, and I know I'm looking at anglicized versions of the names, but still, what, what, well, I don't even know what name um, you're saying. The uh, the young guy who's who's following our main hero, Kimbai. Um, uh, I have it written down. Uh, Katsushiro. Katsushiro. Um, he uh, the way he falls in love with the local. Um, it doesn't it doesn't oh, work yeah. out for him, but the sort of the sort of, the member of the hero band. Uh, falling in love with with someone outside of his class, I think it might be one of the first times that happened too. Well, you know what's interesting about that though is that the one element of that 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 may have been a pioneered he may have been pioneering a motif that you see in a lot of movies, mm-hmm. but he certainly didn't pioneer the outcome because that not getting the girl thing at the yeah. end would never have happened in a modern Hollywood. Oh no, movie. no, no, not at all. Nobody wants to see the noble hero totally rejected. Yeah. So. And I, I think that that speaks to speaks to themes in the movie too. Um, this whole classism thing that. Yeah. They can't. They just can't because of the culture, and it's yeah. certainly a critique on that culture because we really want them well, to. Well, here's the weird thing, and this is this is speaking to themes in general. Is this is an an issue I have with this movie every time I've watched it? I can never really decide what the central message of the film is, um, because you do have that like classism, like, but at the same time, it like it comments on that element of the classism 
uh, class system being problematic, but at the same time, it totally spends a lot of time reinforcing how, how basically it feels to me like it's reinforcing how samurai are legitimately better than normal people. Yeah, no, it certainly it you know certainly I mean? plays it's to that kind of, because it's, well, for instance, all of our villagers are pretty much indistinguishable. They even all have the same haircut. A few of them have more right, stubble. They all than have others. the same. But every single right. samurai is unique. Totally they dress unique. differently, they act differently, they <laughs> weaponize themselves differently. Um, yeah, well, and then when you see, like, um, what, what is it, um, where they find all the samurai armor yeah. uh, it, with the peasants and, like, the comments that they make about the peasants and how... Yeah, they no longer trust I them. Mean, these and are, they, they right, and it's like, you get into this thing where it's like, well... Almost decide to kill them out Which, there. what is the... Yeah, like what is the message here? Is it that the sam is it that the class system is justified and real? Yeah. Or is it that the class system is unjustified and just an arbitrary concept? Yeah, and certainly like I uh, Yeah. Kukuchio's uh response to that Kukuchio? I <laughs> I the uh yeah. our our comic relief character, I suppose. Um his response there in that scene is probably uh the closest the movie comes to having a point, I think, <laughs> at least an outright stated point. It's a, if if there are themes, they're very subtle. Is I think what you're getting at. Um, yeah, well, they're subtle enough that you can yeah. get a little bit lost on yeah, what they actually yeah. are. But but his sort of reason you suck speech, because <laughs> he 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 goes. I mean, he he tirades against you know the the peasants are evil. They're crooks. They'll kill you just as soon as look at you. <laughs> they'll steal from you, yeah. they'll lie to you, uh, and it's all to protect themselves. But why do they feel the need to do that? That's your fault. You samurai have been oppressing them, you steal from them, you rape their women, you blah, blah, blah. Right. So it's it's this sort of, you know, while the, while the classes are all very clearly presented, and, and again, what I said last week, uh, there's the whole idea that, you know, when you have a period piece, this was made in 1954, but obviously it's set in, you know, 17th century Japan. Um, when you have a period piece, you're trying to comment more on, you, by its nature, comment more on what you're, uh, right, what you're right. doing and now you're doing, than what they're doing then. Yeah. I mean, and, and, uh, Kurosawa was working in a pretty controversial time yeah, in Japanese history. history I mean, that's so. occupied. I mean, that plays a big part. Post World War II occupied Japan, and and that certainly gets <laughs> plays a big part in why he was criticized for being Western too. Um, yeah, because well, and the yeah, and the, you we and we find out later in the story <coughs> that um, uh, was it Kukichio um, is a has literally his origin is almost an identical experience. <coughs> yeah. Where he was rescued by someone after an attack from some bandits or something like that. He he doesn't explain it, but he says like I was that baby. I am that baby. Yeah. Yeah. And you and so you kind of see like oh, uh, well he has he finds himself basically having switched classes yeah. and he's pulled like himself that. out of peasantdom into this samurai class and he's not really ex- He's not really uh, accepted by it, especially at first, until he until he kind of proves himself. Right. They, I mean, they know he's fake. They know he's a liar. Right. But and but then when he dies, he's given the honors of a samurai. Yeah. And he's, he's when they bury him and everything. He's certainly like that. trying too hard with that with that plus two yeah. sort of or- overcompensation he's got. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like, the seven foot long blade. Yeah. He like is so awkward it's, pulling out. It's so funny. which is another another minor point of influence that I think Kurosawa has had. Just this idea of oversized weaponry that plays a lot in a, yeah, yeah plays a lot in anime now. Um, but you know, actually, on, on a note of his influence, he's and I, I I don't know if I can say this definitively, but looking at his work and the works that have come after it, I think he might be the most remade director in cinematic history. Is not oh, yeah. not only Seven Samurai uh, get remade of the Magnificent Seven and Magnificent Seven gets gets remade. There's a lot of plot elements that show up all over. But well, there's yeah, also his, full, his... full plots that 
Well, yeah, we've seen this plot yeah. multiple times, yeah. multiple times since this movie. That is for certain. Yeah, and in fact, this is this is a guaranteed go-to uh, action movie plot at this yeah. point. Yeah, and that's I mean that's, that just speaks to how good it is at its job. That it's it's a great great movie. Um, and like I said, I didn't realize I'd been watching it so long because it's so well paced. Um, it's like last week we talked about the pacing was great until the very end, and you felt there was a disconnect. But we never we never get any sort of disconnect in this film like we did in um, the Grand Illusion. It's not like there's no. it's not like after the intermission it's a separate movie. It's no, there's there's a definite flow of action yeah. that is very easy to follow. Like you have never, you never feel like they shifted focus or anything. Like you know who the main characters are, you know what the main story is, yeah. you know, you roughly know what's going to happen. Um, and I think that's a positive thing for the most part. Oh yeah, I, I like the way you said that too. A definite flow of flow of action, no no change of <laughs> real or flow of focus and. and um, because I think that's reflected a lot in uh, the cinematography and a lot of my favorite shots from this movie. Um, like when the samurai first arrive at the village, it comes from them surveying it over the hill, and we pan out. And if you, fortunately, I had the uh, the privilege of watching this on a larger television, but uh, yeah, but uh, <clears throat> we pan around from them looking at the village and yelling to to greet them. Uh, to a shot of the village and just all of the peasants scattering and going yeah, and hiding yeah. in the background. And it's just, it's this really great flow and it's a really, really long shot. Um, I mean, distance wise, not length wise. Um, so you can't really tell what's happening with this, that, that establishment of action in the background. Um, just, uh, it's, it really, it works well with the story too. Uh, there's there's a couple yeah. of shots where and I have one visually there's a great shot during the battle sequence in the in the second half of the movie because um, there's a there's a lot of scenes there where there's multiple layers of action there's there's action right up front at the camera there's a mid action and there's a background action all going on because it's a very well choreographed battle not just a fight scene um, but there's one specific shot where we're looking through a fence, and all we see are the the legs of the bandit's horses up front uh, before a bandit falls, I think, on the screen at the end of that, that clip, which is a stationary yeah. camera, and we've got, you know, another fight. We're looking through the fence, and we've got the horse's legs, and then there's another fight, you know, six feet behind them, and another horse is coming, <laughs> coming around a corner in the background. Um, mm. It's just layered. And the cinematography, layering it like that, is really, really amazingly done, and expertly done because it all just it, it synthesizes. It all comes together. Nothing stealing your focus. And if you do focus on one thing over the other, you know, watching it for a second time and realizing that that everything's going on there just amazed me, <laughs> really, because I did watch this twice. Just because. Oh wow! I know it was a commitment, <laughs> but yeah. Seriously. Well, you know, and speaking of like cinematography sort of things, I one of the things I noticed that I didn't notice the first time I watched this film is there's some very very subtle use of um, slow motion. Yeah. At a few really key points. Yeah. He he will throw on the slow motion. It, it's not super slow motion. It's just just a little yeah. bit of a slowdown to let you really see what's happening. It's always and always I for really yeah. like it. Always for a dramatic punch too. Yeah, um, yeah, and it works really well. And I feel like that's something I don't know if that was being used in action movies prior to this, but it certainly is used extensively in action movies yeah. now. But I feel like relatively compared to the modern action movies compared to the real subtlety that he uses it with yeah. in this film. Oh yeah, absolutely. I just feel like somebody's wielding a sledgehammer now <laughs> because like like his is so subtle. Like it just suddenly the film just slows down just a little bit to like yeah. to let you savor that moment. Yeah. Whereas like in a modern action movie, well, I mean, you know, you know what modern <laughs> yes. action movies are like. Yes. 
Whereas so, in Die Hard like, Four, there's nothing subtle. Right. <laughs> right, and there's and what scene isn't in slow motion? Yeah. But yeah, like it, it's just one of those things where I was really impressed by how well that's used. Yeah. To make you feel what he wants you to yeah. feel. And on a flip side, there's one bit that really took me out of the movie. Um, okay. Toward the end, uh, in some of the some of the battle sequences, uh, he speeds up the film very clearly. Yeah. Um, and I think I don't know if that's necessarily a problem or if it's just that. Uh, in my movie viewing culture, whenever f- film is sped up, it's always meant as something comedic. Right, where all of a sudden you're supposed to be singing Yakety Sack. Yes, and it's just, it's very off-putting to, uh, to see that happen in a dramatic setting from my, from my yeah. perspective. Well, and I wonder if that has something to do with how well he was able to choreograph and make happen what he wanted to happen. Yeah. If it was like, oh, this is way too slow. Yeah. Like, we couldn't get them to do it fast enough safely, so now we're going to crank up the yeah. speed a little no, bit. No, and, and I think that's like, probably I, true, and it, it's certainly justified. But yeah, it still well, t- and, you know, took me out. Yeah, it didn't really take me out as bad, like, as it seems to have for you. I kind of noticed it, but I was like, well... I guess, in my mind, I was so... You know... Like, at the same time, I was kind of like... Some of the battle scenes were a bit long, and so I was like, oh... He's speeding it up. Good for him. <laughs> we can get because like, you, know, I guess, you know, if we had from, played that from the in moment time, it's we keep talking from the mo- you go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, like from the moment the movie starts, you know roughly how it's going to end. Yeah. And so the battle doesn't need to be too long because you already know the outcome. Mm-hmm. You don't know which samurai are going to die, but you know some will. But that's also the other thing is like we don't or we do because we've seen a million action movies. Yeah. People who are watching this when it first came out, who knows what they thought? Yeah. Because I mean. they haven't because, seen all this play out before. Right. They hadn't seen this exact same or very similar plot done to death. So, you know, it's hard to put yourself in that mindset. So I don't know what he was thinking at that time. Yeah. yeah. Maybe maybe just what he was thinking was oh. We've got three and a half hours worth of film. Let's speed this up so it's not three hours, four hours of film. (laughs) Yeah. But, no. And obviously, obviously, I I joke there, but uh, he's very obviously a masterful editor, too. Um, Yeah. There's there's a lot of... I don't know if they shot it on multiple cameras. I think they might have. Yes, it was. Um, Um, I read that in the in the description of it yeah. like he this is the first film where he used multiple cameras to convey action in a battle yeah and it said after this he used it extensively in the rest of his work I'm sure I'm sure because there's a lot so of moments I, where uh, there's sort of just this this flow of action despite a change of angle yeah um, you know just, just apparently that's multiple cameras yeah yeah it's clearly it's clearly multiple cameras but just it still flows so well and it certainly you didn't see that prior to to this moment. Yeah, that that was pretty impressive, and like even like when you compare it to, I mean, yeah, I mean it's a very modern approach to yeah a battle sequence. I, all I can say is I'm glad he didn't pioneer shaky cam because <laughs> <laughs> at least I could understand everything that was going on, on the screen all the time. Yeah. So yeah. Um. That's certainly true, and it's not even it's not even used uh, just in the action films. Like uh, when we uh, when Rikishi, the villager, gets introduced at the beginning, uh, he's all you know he's ready to go kill everybody, and obviously we learn he has a very good reason to want to uh, yeah want to enact revenge on the bandits because uh, they took his wife. Um, yes, but spoiler uh, alert. Yes. <laughs> but I don't think we need to say that. I think that's pretty no, well established. No, I don't. Not this, we're talking know, about that just... extensively about a movie. We're going to uh, spoil a bit. So, um, but no, even when he's introduced, it's sort of used because he uh, he's standing up and yelling in that in that crowd of people, and then walking off and and dropping down himself to to you know cry or whatever, just bury himself. Mm. Um, and it's just and and even there, we get this sort of multi camera take on things of yeah. him, him walking and, and dropping and it's it's very very interesting 
And that, that scene that reminds me of one of my other favorite things he does. Um, he does, I, I'm sure there's a technical name for it, um, but this, uh, the zooming method he uses when from establishing shots. Like when we first see those villagers, um, and he does this a few times throughout the movie, but when we first come in on the village, you know, we've got, we've had the, the bandits introduced riding silhouette through the, through the wilds. They discuss how they're going to come attack and somebody overhears them. And then we, we, we cut immediately to, uh, to, uh, the village, but we cut to the village and the establishing shot is just this big aerial shot. And then we jump. We don't zoom. It's a stationary shot, and we jump to a ha to a shot about halfway there, and then we jump to a shot that's really zoomed in on it. But they're all stationary <laughs> shots instead of just this continuous zoom in. And it's it's <laughs> I don't know. It's, I want to say masterful, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if I can define it any any better than that. Yeah, like I think I remember what you're talking about. Yeah, it's a bit it, vague it, in my head. But. He does it again with uh, when they first go see the old man, um, the village el elder. Uh, my translation just called him old man. I think I read that. I, I read someone referring to him as grandpa, so I assume it gets translated differently in in others. But. Well, yeah, I know. Yeah, there's some Japanese <laughs> involved there that we're not going to talk about. <laughs> but uh, but when we establish him and he lives in the mill. So we get this nice idyllic shot of the mill in the meadow, um, and then and then we jump to just kind of a shot of the wheel on the mill, and then we jump to a shot of the water flowing over the wheel and turning the wheel, just this real, like only seeing like two buckets of the wheel at a time in the shot, that's how close it is, and then we jump to his face. And for the rest of that scene, yeah. whenever he talks, he's talking directly at the camera. And it, yeah, that's an interesting thing that happens yeah. every it, time he talks, basically. Yeah. It ties us... First, it, it lets us know that, that the elder and the mill are inseparable. And we only yeah. see him once outside of the mill. And it's right yeah. after right after the uh, samurai discuss killing everyone once they discover that the villagers have have a tendency to kill retreating samurai <laughs> and steal right. all of their stuff. Um, which, you know, and he, which is interesting there because he walks in and says, hey, what's wrong? And and Kimbai, uh, our, our main character, Kanbei, or whatever, <laughs> I, can't, I can't talk. Uh, he's, he just says nothing. And it's, you know, it's his, it's how they signify that he's accepted, you know, what uh, what our upstart character has has told them that it is their fault that the the peasants are like that, or even if yeah. he hasn't accepted responsibility, he's accepted that he still needs to help them because of how everybody feels. Right. Um. Anyway, what I mean to say is, it, it, it that shot, that jumping in establishes the mill. It doesn't just establish scene, but then the cut to his face ties ties the elder to the mill which is something we we keep in mind and then later when we find out they're burning the mill we understand the horror of that, that not only right, right. not only is the elder about to die but now his family has run to go get him and then that baby that Kuchirio rescues uh, from that fire and running down the river with it and he has his moment of Understanding. Uh, yeah, an epiphany. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's his turning point. Um, obviously, obviously, uh, one thing Kurosawa didn't invent was the epiphany, but he certainly uses no. them very well. <laughs> yeah. Let's see here. Yeah. So, in other things that I, just to make some lighthearted jokes, um, <laughs> not jokes so much, but just comments on other pieces of yeah. cinematography. First of all. Um, <laughs> it seems he also may have pioneered the the scene of people standing around watching things. <laughs> like I don't know, like of there I being like no this film action a lot. on screen and them just yeah, like I like this film a lot. But man, there's an awful well, not even people talking, but people episode uh, 
shots of crowds watching things that we don't see the thing they're watching. Yeah, yeah. No, that certainly happens a lot during uh, during our main Samurai's introduction. Yes. Because they're talking and, about... And it happens a, a few other times where you're like, yeah. oh, really? And even in that first scene with the villagers, they spend, you know... Is, uh, uh, one thing I really like the sound-wise in that film is that we've got this big, epic, build-up music, and I assume it's it's period-appropriate music. I don't know enough about Japanese I composing don't history to, to say that. But this big, like, epic drum thing happening as, as the bandits ride through, and it continues, and then it just stops when we see the villagers all face down in the dirt, crying out. Yeah. But we don't even hear them at first because we got such a wide shot. So as we step in, and he does this a few times, he stops the music, but still has this sort of uh, this whole idyllic thing. It really only happens in the village. Uh, we get the background with the birds, and when we when we do yeah. the mill, we always hear that stream. Um, and it stops then when the battle starts. Yeah. Nature gets quiet too. Well, and there's a lot of really great use of sound for building atmosphere. The yeah. only thing I had, the only major problem I had with the sound was several times in the battles especially, the what I think has to be extra sound, like ADR sound, mm-hmm. was sometimes really jokey sounding. Yeah. There were a few, I swear to God, boings. <laughs> I was like, what? What was that noise? I think Did I, I just do... Hear- I feel like I remember I think, I, one. And yeah, like that, there was one like where somebody cut where somebody. I swear to God, I heard I, I heard boing boing, and I was like, what? <laughs> wait, wait. I even went back and listened and again. I was like, yeah, that's boing boing. I'm like, what? Really? Yeah, yeah. So I don't was, know what happened there. There was some cartoony use of sound, and that certainly yeah. uh, <laughs> that certainly takes me out too. But no, I I, I understand that. <laughs> But yeah, uh, but in general, in general, the sound is is very good and very atmospheric, and it works very well. And the music only comes in in dramatic ways. And yeah, it's, yeah, it's really it's it's interesting. Yeah, no, the, to do the that music because there's... play the music plays fine. Like I mean, yeah. like does a great job. I'm yeah. It's yeah. only the sound effects that are yeah. The sound sometimes effects are a little right. flawed. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. It's the sound the soundtrack is so minimalist, but when it's yeah. used, it's used bombastically. Yeah, and and it, obviously that that helps the atmosphere too. Um, so great, great sort of. Uh, I'm going to use the word atmospheric again. But yeah, well, <laughs> we we are going to have to we're going to have to go buy a thesaurus for this. We will need it. Thing. We're going to need a thesaurus. Um, so let's wait. We've got theme, cinematography. Well, let's, let's talk a little yeah. more about the theme because I think. Okay. You know, yeah. We, we, I actually have some other th- questions about that. Yeah. Well, you go ahead then. Okay. Well, we've got the theme of you know class conflict, right? But there's yeah. another theme that is related, kind of, to what you know, to the grand illusion we watched last week about um, the merits or lack of merits of you know war. Okay. And I can't. Get this film, just the same as with the class system issue, can't get a real good grip on if it is <laughs> pro or anti. I think it's anti. Yeah. Because you get into that whole, like, the epiphany of um, uh, Kukichio uh, and, like, about, like, um, not his epiphany, but his comments about why the peasants are why they are. Yeah. But then again, we close at the end of the film with, like, this sort of, like, really, like, odd message about like the victory belongs to those peasants yeah and like but the question becomes like if it's an anti I don't want to say it's either anti or pro war but a lot of it has a pro feeling because you they definitely play into the idea that these samurai are doing a great thing yeah. and there's no they do not flinch at all at the idea of ju- them just slaughtering these bandits yeah I and think so yeah oh, go, go ahead go ahead okay I, I think, and, and you compare it to The Grand Illusion again, I think uh, maybe just coming off of watching The Grand Illusion and, and watching this uh, makes me feel this way, but um, in The Grand Illusion we have our our two aristocrats talking about you know, sense of duty and, and they fight 
uh, for the glory, um, but they fight because they kind of feel like they have to. It, it's there. It's it's just what is ex expected of them. Um, and then our other guys fight because they want to, and but but the fighting is is pointless in the Grand Illusion clearly. Whereas in this movie, we've got the same sort of aristocracy uh, divide. The samurai are obviously upper class, <clears throat> and they fight for duty normally. But here they're fighting not not necessarily for duty, but just for the thrill of it, because they're not getting anything out of this fight. Right, and that's that's how they go into it. But when when we come out of it, and with the victory belonging to the peasants, it's it's sort of his 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 moment where <coughs> in <coughs> sorry in the Grand Illusion, um, there's that moment where where he sees De Boulier sees the aristocracy slipping away, and I right. think there's a similar moment here. He sees that they can't maintain this separation that they're people too and uh, pushes into that I think post-war Japan and one of the, one of the reasons Kurosawa gets gets uh, uh, yelled at I suppose for being too Western is that he's got this sort of you know everybody's everybody's important uh, idealism there's no sense of duty in what he's shooting for and obviously I, I think I think it's very much a uh, evolving view. I think this is kind of a midpoint in that view. Like he's still not quite sure where he's going, Kurosawa. Right. But <clears throat> but coming out of World War Two and going going into a more uh, a more Western Japan that we have today, uh, that sort of individual freedom mentality of of America, uh, individualism and. Uh, I think I think there's seeds of that here, and I think maybe one of the issues why we can't definitively pinpoint what he's trying to say on these themes. We can say we can say he's talking about these things, but we can't say what he's saying. Right, is that it's he the, doesn't necessarily know what he's saying yet. Right, it's like kind of like we're in the middle of an internal conflict. <clears throat> we're in the middle of this conversation about like what what does this like battle mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. And he, yeah, he doesn't say in the film exactly. Because, I mean, like, when they say, like, the victory belongs to these peasants, they also, the main character, looks so mournfully at those graves. And you kind of get into this question about, like, again, like something we got from the Grand Illusion, where they, the, the, um, the characters, uh, the point is made that the, or you, actually, I think it was you made it from, uh, some other outside source about the fact that the only um you know the reason that battles keep happening is because we make them into such a grand affair yeah and it's like well the peasants won but since the peasants won is that just perpetuating the fact that you know this kind of war for the sake of saving these people who need to be saved but at the same time you know now they're going to glorify these samurais and these samurai in this battle yeah, and it maintains. Which, it right, maintains is it the just going to? It really does right, it's going. It's going to literally just perpetuate the cycle, and so it's really, for me, it was very difficult to latch on to. Like, well, yeah, you're saying that. Possibly, you're saying that um, the victory belongs to the peasants because they are now, their life is just a little bit higher now than it used to be, and that now we are closer to being equal than we ever were before. Yeah. But at the same time, you're left going, but at the same time, like, the peasants won, and that's a problem. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and to that regard, I mean, this was just a roving band of bandits to begin with. So, it's, you know, the samurai leave, and obviously they haven't left directly, because that, that last scene has to be taking place at least weeks after the first one, right. or the, the battle, because, you know... It's, it's a planting season now. It can't be, it can't be immediate, um, and they've they've rebuilt the fields which they had flooded. So yeah, it's, um, obviously it's they're planting rice. So the fields are already kind of flooded because that's how you plant rice. But um, but yeah, it's uh, 
they've stuck around, but what's another band of bandits is going to can come by and and ruin everything again. So it's not it's nothing really changes at the end. They've defeated this battle. Right. It's kind right. of episodic in that nature. Um, well, and then and you get into this question of like, well, is the, at the same time is what he's saying about the bandits or the peasants being the real winners discussing the fact that the peasants have in a little bit of a way built the confidence to defend themselves Maybe. and to deal with their own problems because you do see the peasants participating in the battle I mean of course they're super they're made super generic and everything but they do act as pikemen and you know defeat the bandits like yeah the samurai kill a lot of people but the peasants do an awful lot of stabbing yeah. oh yeah they, they kill enough they kill enough um, so is that, I mean, that could also be the message, like, well, these people are just as good, and you don't really need samurai, all you need is confidence. It's so... Yeah. <sighs> I, I know, you can definitely draw yeah. that from it, in a way. Um, I don't know if I necessarily agree that that's, like, a main thing it's trying no, to I say. No, I don't know, but it's just another thing that, you know, yeah. pops into my head, like, yeah. you know, what is this all, yeah, what is this... Basically, the line that we're right at the point where you would expect the movie... Or hope the movie would tell you, okay, this is what it's all about. It yeah. tells you, but it doesn't really tell you what the movie's about. Yeah, and it's also, it's the point it's where we expect, big. you know, we know people have died, um, but we'd still expect some amount of happiness. But all that's right. really happened is everything's gone back to normal. Right, they're just out there planting. Yeah, they're planting, they're doing their song, but that's what they would have been doing anyway. And... You know, we've got this Pyrrhic victory for the samurai, the four living ones, and the three dead in the background, which is an awesome shot, too. The three. <laughs> yes, it is. I, it's three and four. Four dead, three alive. Not, <laughs> I, I switch that. But, yeah, but uh, it's still, yeah. It's, but yeah. Well, I mean, they use that shot on the cover, at least on yeah. the cover of the copy I had before yeah, it was I'm stolen. Sure. I'm sure they, sure they do, because it's, it's, it's an amazing shot that really exemplifies how they're feeling at the time. But still nothing's changed and Kuroshiro uh, doesn't get the girl she goes back, she ignores him she runs away from him uh, and just goes back to her life as a peasant um, and uh, you know nothing's nothing switched it's very Pyrrhic and our main character Kimbai he was really the only one who ever bridged the class gap successfully but even at the end he's just in it looking to he's he's in it for the fight and he's looking for that fight that's finally going to kill him and he hasn't found it yet so right. he's not changed right and then you get in this whole yeah and then him looking for the fight that's going to kill him is a, a whole other theme where talking about like is this futile kind of thing because the, his conversations with his former comrade whose name I do not remember yeah. is so nihilistic yes. it is so like oh you're not dead yet you know, nope neither are you how'd you make it out well I basically didn't I was trapped in yes. that burning whatever and, and the building know. fell on me and, and I thought it had ended or I knew it had ended is what he said yeah I knew it was the end, but then he's still there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He, he ends the recap of his story in a way that would suggest he had just died. <laughs> right. But, but obviously he's, he's so telling the story, so he yeah. didn't die. Yeah, and so that's... it's uh, Yeah. Basically what we've come to is that we don't know what the theme of this film is. <laughs> I, think, I think so. I think so. Listeners, congratulations. You've listened to <laughs> two grown men discuss the fact that they have no idea what the hell is going on <laughs> for like 15 minutes. I watched it twice in a week. I have no idea what it's saying. Well, I've, I've uh, probably seen this film five, six times, and I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a, there's a lot of you know there's obviously, and that's a, that's a, I think that's what bothers me that we get to the end and nothing's changed because there's all kinds of jabs at everybody. I mean, obviously the peasants they're they're not great people, the samurai, and maybe that's it. We're all equal in our terribleness. Yeah, um, yeah, it's like we're all awful. Yes, but then again, like, the samurai too, but... aren't awful, and that's what part of what bothers me about the film a little yeah. bit, is, like, in it, 
in the, Kim, the Kim environment Kim doesn't seem of, to have any weaknesses. Yeah, in the environment of the film, that seems to be saying, like, oh, we're all equal, everybody deserves a sort of a fair world, yeah. the samurai are nearly godlike. Yes. And I do... And I see this in Japanese culture here a little more often than I'd like. There's this... Uh, and then possibly this is supposed to be a commentary or something from Kurosawa. I don't know. Uh, they Samurai in this culture sometimes get very, very uh, like glorified. And, I mean, like, you get into the same sort of conversation that um, you have with about knights in, um, <laughs> in, in medieval yeah. uh, Europe. These are still just fighters. Yeah. They are and warriors. It, they kill people for a living. Yeah. And, and in making them of, to be, like, nearly godly is sort of yeah, yeah, upsetting. Yeah, no. And it's it's what I what I quoted last week, what you were what you were referring to, uh, was uh, the Americanization of Emily, uh, and and the idea that if we continue to deify uh, murderers, <laughs> essentially, if we continue yeah. to deify um, the battle, and and make into heroes the the average dead, but also make into heroes the people doing all of the killing who just happen to survive. Um, <laughs> We uh, we just perpetuate the whole idea of war, and it, it becomes this grand thing instead of this horror that it should be. Yeah, um, and and this film seems to end on a note saying these men were great and they did a great thing for these people that they didn't have to yeah. help. But at the yeah. same time, it's like I don't know if that's a great message. But you know, yeah. it's it's a great message that they humbled themselves and helped people that couldn't have been helped. Right, but they humbled themselves by slaughtering 40 men. But they humbled themselves by slaughtering 40 men, and the fact that it's still viewed as, well, they had to humble themselves in order to do this. Right. That they, That's how great they were, that they humbled themselves. Right, even their, this. well, and then you get into, like, uh, it's, that whole thing is like, are you just finding another way to make yourself seem awesome. Yeah. yeah. By by humbling yourself. It's like, well, yeah, they humbled themselves, but otherwise they wouldn't have been able to kill 40 bandits. Yeah. yeah. With with apparent ease. Yeah, it's a very it's a very conflicting sort of idea. Um the theme, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've said this a couple of times now, but I'm not sure that Kurosawa knew necessarily what what he was getting at, and maybe maybe to that regard, um, given the time period that it comes out, the entire point was to facilitate conversation. Right, he could just be saying, "Do we know what the theme of yeah. our lives are?" Yeah, like we're in this situation. Like, what are we doing? Where, yeah, where are we going? We have yeah. our the empire has fallen. We're <laughs> we're living in an occupied country, and uh, what are we doing? Yeah. How are we going to react? How do we move so, on? So yeah, it's possible this is supposed to be a, <laughs> a coffee table book, a conversation <laughs> piece. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. So um, <laughs> on my list of things to talk about, yeah. which I have, um, good. At least some of one of us let, does. <laughs> let's see here. No, these are awful things that I just wrote down. <laughs> that like because you know when you have a movie that's three and a half hours long, sometimes you have to let things a off the chest. No, no, the notes The notes I made while watching this movie, it, it's like four pages of stuff. I mean, yeah. lots, of, lots of it's plot point, but... Well, most of mine are just, like, the same sort of things I would say to somebody watching the movie with me that are not nice. Yeah. First of all, <laughs> wow, there's an awful lot of ass crack in this film. <laughs> that is true. There are many butts in this film. Like, I feel like that, that, should, is, be, that I should be on the warning label somewhere. That is definitely a difference between American culture and Japanese culture. You will, it, yeah, but as like... As exemplified in the samurai. Or, in, not the samurai, the sumo. Um, yes, this is true, but in my daily life... They are much life, more okay with butts. my daily life in Japan, I see very little ass crack. <laughs> good, and good. Well, I Well, that's, like, that's part of the westernization of the country. Right, right, right. Maybe that's what this movie is actually about. <laughs> <laughs> Like all those shots and people's butts and the actual commentary. <laughs> the theme... Alright, alright. I think we can end on that note. 
The okay. theme of the samurai, samurai is that there need to be less butts. Right, right. Will we become Western and show less butts? Or remain Japanese and show a whole lot of ass? I think we really should end there. On that note, this has been the second <laughs> on episode note, of... On that note, America's great because there are less butts. Yeah. Well, unless you really like, you know... Unless you like but, butts. Because, right, and then know, America's different, different strokes for different folks. Don't right. stroke butts without asking. Right. Um, <laughs> we've gotten really away from And this. don't wield weapons without protection for your ass. I think <laughs> yes. it's an important message. Very, always. You know, don't... You don't want, like, a 12-foot sword... So that you just cut your butt. <laughs> right, right. Um, you tried to by accident. take it out of the sheath and you slice your own ass cheek off. Yes, yes. That's, little, that's not a good thing. <laughs> no, actually, on that note, that was that was really confusing to me uh, in his character. Because he had on... Uh, Cuccio, Cuccio, uh had, had had that armor. And he had the helmet even. and he had that, But he wasn't wearing pants. But that happened several times. <laughs> And I guess you're kind of getting into a kilt thing where, like, oh, it's way easier to run if you're not wearing pants. Yeah, but it, I don't know. He wasn't even wearing... You know, it didn't seem to me that he was even wearing, like, the underwear that thing, well, the loincloth thing I he think was established it, as having on earlier. I think it was... There was something in the front, because I didn't see any... I didn't see any wang. <laughs> just, just butt. Yeah, a lot of butt. <laughs> Actually, one thing we didn't mention on that character, I know, I know, I said we'd end on butts. But, right, uh, I know. I really, I really, really liked him. I'm really and disappointed. He was, he was a different. Uh, everyone else was really stoic, uh, and he definitely brought the comedy to it. Even, even the guy who was only there because he was lighthearted had a great, a few great comedy mo- moments. But Cuccio certainly thing. And one thing I read was that, uh, and you mentioned this before we started talking. Uh, that Kurosawa had written it as the Six Samurai, and decided it was too serious of a movie, so threw threw this seventh guy in there, um, which is weird because not only <laughs> he provides the closest thing we have to to a message, yeah, and he wasn't even in the original draft, um, but uh, but at the same time, uh, it's just funny that he's kind of given free reign. They let him improv half the stuff he does on screen. Isn't isn't really in the script. It's just him messing around. Yeah, and it it actually works out really well. It, honestly, yeah. I can't imagine watching this movie as the Six Samurai because yeah. it would have been almost unwatchable without him in there. He is just enough of a presence of personality. Yeah. To because otherwise you'd be like, oh gosh, I just watched three and a half hours of men talking like this. <laughs> But he's a really great actor, and they're all really great actors. It's a, the acting in this movie is amazing. Oh too. yeah, it's. Um, and I look forward wonderful. to seeing him again because he he shows up in a few more of the movies in the Criterion Collection. We're gonna watch. Yeah, and, and I he, assume he, he plays a totally with different character. A lot too. Yeah, and I assume he's gonna play yeah. a totally different character. So yeah, it'll be interesting. Yeah. Hopefully, to see. we'll see it. All right. So to recap, butts. Yeah, butts, butts, and, butts. Uh, next week we're talking about the Lady Vanishes. <laughs>